What's our lesson? You're ready. Tim Junkins. Just a quick hypothetical. What if I had said, no, I'm not ready? <laughs> I'm just saying that for making me stretch for time. Another, another song. song. Another yeah, song. Another song. So. Aaron, the small, I don't think I get away with that very easily because everybody would just kind of turn around and see me making this motion. <laughs> stretch for time. Through the course of writing uh, lessons, you often form branching paths. You start with ideas, analogies, stories, fables, examples, whatever it is, and you kind of wind up writing more than one lesson. You write a, you wind up writing like a lesson and a half or a series of lessons. I was actually working on two entirely separate lessons this week, and I sat around until about last night, and finally I just flipped a quarter and decided which lesson I was going to work on today. And so I had written two entirely complete lessons, so the next time I speak, we'll get to see the next lesson I worked on, which uh, that was just kind of the idea of I'm always inspired and I'm always moved to talk about things. And there's always like topics I want to focus on and things like that. And like this would make a good idea and this would make a good idea. And so ultimately you have to kind of choose. So today we're going to start off with a story because hey Tim always starts off with a story. Today's story is 100% absolutely not true. It is actually a fictional story but it functions in the capacity of serving, serving as a modern fable. Uh, it is a story that there's a lesson that you can draw from it, and then we're going to compare that to Scripture and see how an absolutely 100% not true story can possibly serve to improve our spiritual lives with God. Story's about a man named Oliver. Oliver was barely a man. He was just out of his teens. He was reckless. He was drunk. He was often high. He was rich. He didn't have to do anything. His family had built up a mighty empire. And so he decided to live his life recklessly. And he lived his life and partied and he partied and he was frequent in the news. He was just one of those people that the paparazzi loved to follow around because what, what is Oliver going to mess up next? And so they followed him around. And so he had no direction in life because he had no motivation. He had money. He had friends, or so he thought. He had power. And so he decided to not do anything. He just decided to exist as a wealthy millionaire playboy, living and doing whatever he wanted. And then one day, on his family yacht, he went out, and a mighty storm hit, and the, sank, and the ship sank, and everyone on the ship except Oliver perished. And sometime later, Oliver washes up on the shores of a distant island. And on the island, away from his money, and his security, and his family, and his friends, and anything else, he has two options. He can live, or he can die. Those are the two options. And Oliver decided that he was going to live. And he spends an undisclosed amount of time on the island. Weeks, months, years, it's never really established. And so he spends an undisclosed amount of time on the island, and he survives. And he learns to hunt, and he learns to forage, and he learns to make fire. And he survives on the island. And then at some point later, Oliver is rescued. And he returns home, a changed man. He has undergone a crucible. A crucible is when elements are introduced to something and they form something new. Oliver goes through a crucible in which he goes through an experience. And the new elements, the island, the tragedy of losing the people on the ship, the fact that he might not ever get rescued, the, fight, the fact that he might not live through the week, all of these elements are introduced to forge him into a new person. And when he returns home, he changes his ways. And he decides he's going to start helping people. And he uses the training he took. Now, just out of absolute curiosity, this probably won't sound familiar to anybody, but does this story sound familiar to anybody in the room? Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe is one of the inspirations for this story. But the actual story is, Tom, you want to take a guess? It's Arrow. It's Arrow. It's the Green Arrow. It's actually a comic book originated in the 1940s as kind of working off the popularity of Batman. Batman was a popular character, so yeah, we're going to take another millionaire, we're going to make him a superhero. But we're going to mix in a little Robinson Caruso, a little Robin Hood. You know, he's an archer hero. Uh, the thing that Thomas talking about is a show on now called Arrow, which is about this character named Oliver Queen. And I love the idea of this, because it's the idea of forging a hero through a crucible, through a tragedy. 
where he takes the life that he had and he becomes something new, entirely different. There's an opening monologue to the TV show where he talks about becoming someone else, becoming something else. He must become an icon. He must become a representative in order to come back and save his city is his mantra for the show. And you watch him evolve into that, into the show. But more importantly, I really just want to focus on this little bit of the origin story, the idea of a crucible, and how that we as Christians often go through crucibles. Now, like I said at the beginning, we work on branching paths when we write sermons. We sit down, and I'm sure those of you who are knowledgeable in a fair amount in the scripture could probably just start blurting out verses that relate to this. Like, you could talk about the idea of transformation. You could talk about the idea of renewal, about how we are born as new creatures and in the eyes of God. We are, we are transformed through things like baptism and our acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But the passage I'm actually going to be working out of is in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at Psalm 51, starting in verse 10 today. Now, the reason I picked this is because I do a lot of comparative verse study when I'm working on my lessons. What I do is I look up topics and I pull a dozen or so verses and I sit down there and I don't just study the verse, I study the areas around the verse. I study the whole passages of section. One of the big concerns about writing lessons is that it's kind of like you don't want to create a biblical audio bite. You don't want to just take one verse and pop it off and go, hey, there's your lesson. No, you want to really dig into it. You really want to understand why the scripture is saying what it's saying. And so when I was going through this and I was looking at the different verses, Psalm 51 actually spoke to me very personally on this. Psalm 51, for those of you who aren't familiar, is one of the psalms that David wrote after he really, really messes up. He really messes up. He's made a couple of bad decisions, and so he is writing, and he is writing the psalm to God, and he is pleading with him. And so it's one of those things where what I want to talk about the, today is the idea of crucibles of faith that we go through. Now, figuring this out a couple of nights ago, I realized that there are two types of crucibles of faith. The first is the time that is before we are with God. That we are going through crucibles in our lives. There's something wrong. There's something missing. There's something we're searching for. There's a connection we have to make that we haven't made yet. And we go through some rough times. And in the end, when we decide to side with God, we survive that crucible and we become something new. We become Christians. We become followers of God. The other type of the crucible of faith is where we are already Christians and we have lost our way. We're already followers of God. We've already been baptized. We've already gone to church and studied the scriptures. But then along the way, something goes wrong. A family tragedy, problems at home, problems at work. Our heart hardens a little. We shut out the world. We set it aside and we decide we're going to go it alone. That I don't need anybody's help. I can do this on my own. Ooh, how familiar does that sound? And so that's the second type of crucible of faith, is where we decide, and this is the important thing to point out, is that we decide to separate ourselves from God. There's never a moment where God sits down and goes, I'm sick of you. Go to the corner. No, God doesn't operate like that. God wants to be with us in a constant, everyday presence in our lives. And so there are times that we, that me, that people as individuals, decide that I don't need God and I'm going to try and go it alone and I'm going to try and do this without God. I'm not going to do this without water, however. Mm -hmm. And so that is the second type of crucible of faith. And so Psalm 51, starting in verse 10, Create in me a pure heart of God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. From this line, there's a really important thing to point out and I have to point out at first. That David is saying, create in me a pure heart of God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. It's a very famous psalm. It's a very familiar line. But the thing that we often don't consider is he is asking God to create something new in him. God is the creator. He is the creator of the universe. He created the heavens and the earth. 
He created the sky and the ground and the water and the birds and the animals and people. God is the creator. God has demonstrated throughout history that he can create anything. And so David, after making a mistake, goes to God and says, Create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. David is not only asking for a renewed uh, for a steadfast spirit, or a renewed heart, or a pure heart. He is asking for purpose. He is asking that not only God, can you fix me? But when you fix me, can you create in me a willing spirit? So that when I go out there, I can tell the transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. And so that's why I had originally picked this fictional story in the beginning because it is not and this translates to so many passages in the New Testament that our faith, that our crucible that the things that we go through is not just about survival survival is not good enough it is not good enough that we survive the tragedies of our day to day lives but more importantly that we actively do something about it once we've survived it it is not to say that we are not going to have moments of weakness. It is not to say that we are not going to have times where we want to give up. It is not to say that we are not going to have times that we just can't handle the circumstances around us. But what we need to focus on here is that we will get through that. And when we do, we have to do something with that information. It's not good enough just to get through the bad times and to sit around and wait for the bad times to happen again which we've all done before. Oh, well, we've solved this problem, but it's only another week till the next problem shows up. And so David was seeking mercy from God when he wrote this. He, like many of us, was prone to making mistakes, both big and small. David was a devout follower of God. We all know the story of David. David, you know, he, he, so many instances in the Old Testament, so many great things he did. And so he was already a follower of God when he made the, this mistake. And so he has to go back to God again. And he has to communicate with God. And he has to ask God to be with him in our lives. And though this is before the time of Jesus, it is a story that resonates with us as Christians. The idea that, yes, we do mess up. And yes, we do make mistakes. And yes, we go through crucibles. But the most important thing is that when we, when we the, the reason I'm using the word crucible today is because it literally means to forge something new. To forge something new, to come out of something better. What, else, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Is literally what this passage is talking about. When I was younger, I was, all, I was always under the impression what doesn't kill me just really, really hurts. <laughs> but what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Because you learn from it, you overcome it, you overcome from it, and you heal from it, and you move on from it. And so in this passage here, it relates to so many aspects of the New Testament, so many things that Paul wrote in the New Testament, talking about being a new person in Christ. But I had to go all the way back to the Old Testament just to emphasize the point that this is how consistent God is. If you think about the span of time between the Psalms and when the New Testament was written, when the Pauline epistles were written, if you think about that span of time, if you think of the generations and generations that have passed, that God is still the same. We sit around and we often wonder if God is relevant in our lives. We wonder that how can we relate to people who lived so long ago. When we have an example here of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years between things being written and that God is so consistent, that God is still there, that God is willing to forgive us. 
And so I love the end of the section where David asks God that you open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. When we, by the grace of God, survive our crucible, what is our next step? Because crucibles exist in our lives. There are life-changing events, big and small, that change who we are. That they, we, When we seek knowledge, when we seek to improve ourselves, when we seek to become closer to God, it's one of those things that it changes us internally. As another um, quick example, I almost used this this morning. I was going to bring a couple of bottles of water. I'm on that um, water enhancer kick. I, I, won't, I won't say the brand name, but it's like the little bottles of liquid that you just kind of shoot into water, and it changes the composition of the water. It makes it a bold color. It adds a refreshing flavor. It adds stuff to kind of help you wake up and things like that. And more importantly, it stands out from the other bottles of water. That was the earlier example. It wasn't as fleshed out. But just the idea of it's a similar concept of how God is taking something and it is going through a change. And when it is done, it becomes something different. And so we have to analyze what is our next step when we survive those things. More importantly, where are you now? In your personal development. Are you in the middle of it? Is it just beginning? That's the scary part. Because we all know on a core level, <coughs> pardon me, I've got to time that out better. We all know on a core level that we're going to get through it. None of us is so pessimistic that we don't know that eventually things will get better. But poof, when you're at the beginning of that, you could make an argument. You could make an argument that, I don't know, maybe I'm not going to get through this. I, uh, I always talk about it right at the uh, end of the calendar year when my company is about to do inventory. It's like, you can absolutely tell me that we're going to get through it okay, but at the beginning of that first day, when we're standing there and we're looking at everything ahead of us, it's like, I could make an argument that I could be doing this for the rest of my life. But then, a couple of very long days later, we're through and we're done, and life moves on. But more importantly, when we go through this spiritually, when we get past the, the crisis of faith, when we get past the difficulties that we're having, what do we do from there? We grow as Christians. You dive into the Word. You engage in spiritual activity. You increase your knowledge. You talk to people about it. Erickson, Eric has introduced a very wonderful class on Wednesday nights talking about the art of neighbor. And that's one of those things that when you survive your personal crucible, when you survive what you're going through personally, and you're ready to kind of go on the spiritual offensive, you're ready to get out there, you're ready to do something, that's one of the things that we're studying about on Wednesday nights, is the idea of what do we do next as people. And so what you do in that instance is you look at yourself, you look at your gifts, you look at what you have to offer. And there's the part where someone goes, whoa, Tim, I don't have anything to offer. Uh, I've got no special talents. I've got no skills. I can't be that kind of Christian. Well, you absolutely can be. Because I'm a, I was about to use a really terrible word. I would say I'm an amazing human being, but I don't think I'm an amazing human being. I'm an okay human being. Um, I have a skill set, and I feel like I use that skill set kind of okay some of the time. But there is something out there that we can do. There are people that we can always relate to. There are people we can always communicate with. There are things that we can always do. And so we have to kind of live in the same way that David does when he writes the psalm, when he goes to God and he's asking for this. And he's not just asking to be changed. He's asking for purpose. And so that's the thing that we've really got to focus on, is what is our spiritual purpose once we survive these things? But more importantly, today's lesson serves as a kind of footnote because I don't know where we all are in our spiritual lives, but we're all somewhere. We're either in the beginning where it's the toughest, we're either in the middle where we're tired, or we're in the end where we're relieved. 
to be through whatever tragedy is going on. But life is made up of challenges, big and small, that we go through every day. For some of us, for me especially, that challenge is what we do every day. That you show up and there's a brand new set of problems and you've got to sit down and you've got to brainstorm those problems. And there are some of us that there are longer term things going on. There's family issues, there's health issues, there's problems that, that are going on. That's one of the other things that we can be dealing with. And so not only do we need to focus on the challenge of what do we do when we're done, but more importantly, how do we get through it? The answer is we get through it together. That's how we get through it. We get through it by accepting the fact that we need God on our side. That when we do mess up, that when we do make mistakes, that we go to God and we ask for forgiveness. We ask for focus. We ask for diligence. We ask for endurance. We ask for all the things that we need to get through this so that we can become better servants for him. And that's not the easiest thing in the world. It's not. I would absolutely love to tell you that it is the easiest thing in the world. Sign on up, guys. It's going to be a blast. I would love to tell you guys. I absolutely would. But that's the thing is that's not how something new is forged. Crucibles are not formed by gently introducing new elements. No, when you want to go through a crucible, when you want to form something new, you have to really go through something significant. But in the end, and this is the, you know, the Tim's point to hammer home, that it is absolutely worth going through. That's the thing I really want to hammer home, is the idea that though we go through difficult times, though there are times in our lives where it is hard to get up in the morning and it is hard to sleep at night, man, I wish my brain was as active as it was as it is at 1 o'clock in the morning. I could solve cold fusion if my brain was running that fast when I was trying to sleep. And so it's one of those things that though we go through times like that, it is absolutely worth going through because we will be transformed by it. If God can create the universe, if he can set all this in the motion, if he can set us here, if we can get to this moment, then he can absolutely transform you personally. That is something that is within the realm of possibility for God, the creator, and his son who died for our sins. If someone can die from your sins and conquer death, and come back from the dead a couple of days later, I got news, guys. He can handle your problems. It's one of those things that we really don't stop and think about it often enough. We really don't think about the notion of how much power God wields. Because God is God. God is there to listen to our prayers, and talk to on Sunday morning, and talk to when we're... I mean, all those things are absolutely true, but God is also the creator of the universe. You know, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, he is all of these things. And so when we look at the scope of our problems that are going on, and we go to God and we say, Oh, you know, Lord, create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a step, steadfast spirit within me. God can look at you, see that you really mean it, and go, Okay, we're going to do this. And so that is what makes it worth going through the challenges, is knowing that we are going to become better people because of it. The reason that characters in fiction go through so much tragedy is because if the story was, everything was okay all the time, and nothing ever went wrong, and things were cool all the time in the end, I don't think I'd pay money for that. No, we have to understand that there are parallels here. We have to understand that there is tragedy, that there is conflict, that there is resolution. That is the, big, the, the biggest part of the story, is the resolution of knowing that we got through it okay. And so, if you're here today and you're going through this, if you're going through this and you're ready to be transformed, 
we are ready and willing and able to accept that transformation here today. If you're here and you're already a follower of God, David was already a follower of God. He was already a loyal worshiper. But he made mistakes and he had to go back and he had to try his best to correct them. If you're here today and you're on that wavelength, if you're here today and you need to correct a mistake, we are here for that today. Ready, willing, and able right now. I'm a bit of a procrastinator sometimes. It's a bad habit of mine. It was a bad habit when I was in school. It's a bad habit now. But this is one of those things that when you look at the scope of it, when you look at the importance, I want to encourage you as somebody who is up here with the ability to speak about this, that you address the problems now, that you fix them now. If you've got something that you've got to deal with now, just deal with it. I did a sermon series a long time ago on the concept of do something about taking action, about motivating yourself, and motivating others. Because like I said, I'm a procrastinator. It's a bad habit of mine. But I've got friends who aren't. And so I'll be talking to them and say, don't you have a thing to work on? Don't you have to get that project done? Aren't you working on a sermon for Sunday? Maybe you should go do that. <laughs> Maybe I should. And so we have gifts and we have talents and we have the ability to get through this together. And so if you're here today and you're looking to be transformed by that, if you're here today and you're looking for encouragement, I ask you to contemplate these things as we stand and sing the song of invitation. I heard an old story how the Savior came from glory.